first of all, thank you for joining us today as we talk about remote access for the industrial controls environment. Today's webinar is titled Secure Remote Access to the Plant Floor, Filtering the Noise to Identify the Right Solution, and it's being co-presented by Grantech and Dispel. As the title suggests, we're going to be reviewing the types of solutions that are available and methods to help you evaluate them. We're also doing this webinar as COVID-19 continues to affect how we work, so we're also going to quantify some security-related trends going on right now um, related to COVID-19. Um, we're about at time, so let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna be progressing through a few topics today in pursuit of some overarching goals. Uh, first, we'll be touching on COVID-19 related security trends. We'll then talk about what types of re uh, remote access solutions are out there and how to tell the good ones from the bad ones. Um, we're gonna talk about how to model costs and calculate ROI for remote access. And then finally, we're gonna review a couple of technologies that Grant Tech and Dispel put together for you to add into your toolbox. Um, all of this information is meant to sort of clear the noise in the remote access market and empower you to make better choices when evaluating remote access solutions. Uh, some uh, quick housekeeping for today. Uh, number one, eliminate distractions. I know I can easily get distracted while multitasking, but if possible, try to shut other things down so that you can get the most out of today's content. Um, that being said, if you do miss something, this will be recorded. And if you wanna get your hands on the recording afterwards, just po post that into the chat box. Um, which is a good segue, take notes and ask questions, uh, use the chat box on the webinar screen. Um, only you and I will be able to see the comments. So if you're like me and don't love to ask questions that get messaged to a large audience, have no fear, it's a private chat and there's no question that I'll think is a dumb question. And then finally, think about the concepts and how they relate to your specific situation. And now for some introductions. Uh, my name is Jacob Chapman and I'm with Grant Tech. Uh, my title is Director of Industrial IT and Cybersecurity, which means I lead what Grant Tech does and how we do it in the realms of industrial networking, computing, and cybersecurity. Um, I've been working in the space for about seven years now and through various roles. Uh, I'm involved in cybersecurity standards development with ISA, uh, chair a subcommittee in ISA's Smart Manufacturing and IIoT division. Um, my day-to-day -day is working internally to improve our processes and make sure we're delivering solutions in the right way and also working externally with customers to give guidance and recommendations. Um, also presenting with me is Ian. Ian, is it okay if I ask you to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Ian. I'm the president and CFO of Dispel, which I helped co-found in late 2014. My focus within the firm is on making sure that things run extremely quickly, mainly our products and cybersecurity in general. Also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a little birthday shout out might be in order since yesterday was your birthday, Ian. Um, True. Enough, yes. <laughs> today is also my wife's birthday. So uh, I guess happy birthday to you and to her. I know we can't hear the attendees right now, but I'm sure they're wishing you and her a happy birthday as well. All right, so let's start off with the first topic agenda item, um, trends in security amid COVID-19. Uh, we'll start by looking at the opportunity landscape for bad actors and put some numbers around that. Um, so COVID-19 and working from home changes things and we all know that. Um, it also changes the risks and we all acknowledge that too. The part that's harder to pin down is exactly how it changed and by how much, which is where I'd like to provide some insight. Um, in 2017, approximately 3.4% of the U.S. workforce, or 4.7 million people, were telecommuting uh, to work according to a global workplace analytics. Um, and as of early April 2020, 62% of employed Americans are now working from home, according to a Gallup survey. Um, further, most of those individuals uh, report that they intend to remain working from home for some time, even after restrictions are lifted, and I actually include myself in that population. Um, and that growth uh, wasn't gradual, it was practically overnight. Uh, some of the best data we have for remote work growth is provided by network service providers. Um, so Netscope, which is a computer security and services provider, published this data showing user dispersion of those using their services, which essentially represents the percentage of individuals connecting to enterprise systems from remote locations. And essentially most data on that topic looks similar to what you're seeing right now. It's a very sharp and significant uptick uh, when the pandemic was announced. 
Now, finally, there's the quantity of new security risks related to employees using work devices from home, things like sharing computers, uh, connecting from unsecured networks, and so on. Um, a study by one login showed that about one in three knowledge workers have admitted to using corporate Zoom, WebEx, and other conference call systems for socializing with friends and family. Um, I can personally say I've seen this happening too, and likely many of you can as well. Uh, further, 50% of knowledge workers in the US admit to using uh, work devices for personal purposes, such as streaming, and up to 45% admit to providing a login password to a child or a spouse at some point. Now, this is all to give numeric context of what we already know. Uh, the opportunity for bad actors has increased dramatically across the board. Point one is really showing the scale of the change. Point two is demonstra uh, demonstrating the abruptness of that change. And then point three is describing the type of opportunity and risks associated with the change. So uh, we've established that there's an appreciable increase in opportunity for bad actors. How about how are bad actors behaving uh, in response to that change in opportunity. And this is where I think things get interesting. So to give some insight into this, I'm gonna be leveraging some very intriguing information a volunteer organization called the CTI League published, which stands for Cyber Threat Intelligence League. Um, so CTI League is essentially a group of volunteers who started organizing themselves in about mid-March and in just one month had more than 1,400 volunteers across the globe signed up to participate. Um, and their mission is to fight against bad actors taking advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, one of the founders in an interview stated that the reason that they started the group is because of the increase in activity they saw and how it made them angry uh, that people were profiting on the suffering of others in the midst of a pandemic, which is relatable and noble. Um, to make the biggest impact, they are especially focused in the medical sector, not exclusively, but especially focused in the medical sector, including suppliers and pharmaceutical manufacturers. Now, they've issued a report on the precise numbers um, of what they've seen and been able to detect and act on. Um, in one month, they had confirmed over 2,500 phishing uh, messages targeting the healthcare sector. They also submitted 2,800 takedown requests for malicious domains uh, targeting the healthcare sector. 2,800, which is a lot to find in a month. Uh, also, if they are issuing the takedown requests, they obviously went through the full process of identifying, verifying, then issuing the takedown. Um, and that's not counting ones that they found since the report and ones that they have yet found. This is just the first month of their activity. So. Uh, this type of information might be eye-opening for you. Uh, sort of the volume of malicious activity out there is pretty large, and it's good to be aware of at the very least. Um, they also search illegal online markets for stolen credentials, identify which organizations the credentials belong to, and then report them back to the health organization. And they are reporting hundreds of those being found every day. Uh, in 22 cases, organizations such as the U.S. government, CDC, WHO, and the U.N. were being impersonated. And then also, as a worthy mention, I think their logo looks pretty cool, and I'm kind of jealous of it. Now, that report has a lot of other really interesting information as well. For example, they give information on campaigns they found encouraging citizens to break quarantine, incite freedom rallies, um, associate COVID-19 with the distribution of 5G equipment, um, if you'd like a copy of the report, just put a request in the chat and I can send that to you. Now, all this information in this slide is meant to demonstrate that just as the opportunity has increased for bad actors, which we went over in the previous slides, their malicious activity is high as well. Um, CTI's report gives us a peek into that window, uh, specifically in the medical sector, including pharmaceutical manufacturers. For those of you listening that are not in the pharmace pharmaceutical industry, an interesting demonstration, uh, demonstration of the heightened activity which affects basically everybody is the sale of COVID-19 fishing kits. So you might not have heard of this, but what nefarious actors do often is they sell to each other pre-developed kits for implementing phishing campaigns. It basically gives amateurs the ability to launch campaigns, collect login credentials, and then sell them for a profit. Um, without them needing really uh, uh, needing to know how to develop phishing systems or really write code at all. In fact, not only can you buy the kit if you want, you can also subscribe for a monthly fee to have somebody else run the phishing campaign for you, and then they just send you the results, which is interesting. Um, researchers can detect this is happening when they see the same code web pages and pre can messages being used by apparently separate actors. It's actually not even that secret. They're posted pretty openly on dark web websites, and then um, researchers can download them and dissect them so they can better identify them. Um, ultimately, those phishing kits direct a user to a page that looks like Outlook or whatever type of system is relevant to that attacker's purposes in order to get their work or personal login credentials. Now, 
Shown on the screen is a chart which was published by Akamai of recycled fishing kits by month. And you can see the uptick when COVID-19 started. It's almost double the, the quote unquote normal. Now, again, this slide is meant to demonstrate that high volume of malicious activity is going on in response to COVID-19, which does affect everybody and your organization. Um, now, at this point, I think I've covered <clears throat> plenty of trends and examples, so I'll be quick with this last one. But just last week, US announced a ransomware campaign, which is leveraging remote access tools and vulnerabilities in VPNs, which is a very common method of attack. Um, and I think this one was originally announced by New Zealand CERT, and then the US CERT acknowledged and re-announced it. Um, I added this into the webinar just as a nice, very recent example of the type of malicious activity, which is being noticed all the time. And um, by the way, for those of you that are not familiar with US CERT, they put out advisories related to recent attacks, campaigns, and newly found vulnerabilities, including those targeting industrial environments. Um, and you can subscribe to their alerts, and it's a great way to get a finger on the pulse, uh, make you aware of what's going on across the world, and, and build your awareness in general. So I encourage you to do so. Now let's uh, pivot from um, the world in general uh, to manufacturers specifically and the challenges being faced while the pandemic is going on. Um, a PwC survey issued to CFOs in the manufacturing sector found the number one concern with respect to COVID-19 or their number one concern with respect to COVID-19 was the financial impact, including the pandemic's uh, effects on operations. Um, the type of impact on operations most of you are seeing are things like uh, people may need to be socially distanced inside the facility. Uh, getting people in and out of the facility is going to be more challenging. Um, we're seeing things like health screenings and temperature checks at the door. Uh, the financial impact of a COVID-19 outbreak could be significant. Um, travel restrictions is a big one, and that's making it difficult to get people to the facility, or maybe that's just not able to happen at all. And this is affecting maintenance and OEMs. It's affecting projects and commissioning. It's affecting service providers to the facility. Now, all of this does have some sort of an effect on the bottom bottom line, either a long lasting effect or a significant acute impact. And again, these are among CFO's top three concerns right now. But here's the kicker, the same PwC survey included cybersecurity risks as one of the concerns that respondents could uh, list as their top risk concerns. And just 5% of respondents said that cybersecurity was one of their top concerns. So 5% is a pretty small number and it's uh, indicating it's clearly not one of their top uh, priorities. Now, let me qualify that a bit. Um, whenever I express a low attention factor towards cybersecurity, I like to follow up by saying that that's usually pretty understandable. And I can sympathize with the fact that there's so much to worry about right now, cybersecurity is hard to put in the top three. Like I get that. But on the other hand, it is an undeniable fact that it increases risk in a time that it's worse than ever to do so. So we have this interesting predicament and challenge, challenge on our hands. Um, customers have reached out to Grand Tech to put in remote access systems for their ICS to help with some of these issues. Um, and in those requests, I, I do sometimes see convenience and expediency being prioritized over security. Um, the, maybe not frustrating isn't the right word, but I'll use the word. The frustrating part of that is that it doesn't need to be the case. In fact, if you know your way around, it can actually be quite easy to prioritize security. And if you're thinking along, uh, thinking in long term, from a long term perspective, it can actually save you more money than going the convenient route. And that challenge and that predicament is what we're going to be diving into deeper throughout the rest of the webinar. Okay, so let's talk about how remote access can help amid COVID-19. And there's a certain level of this that is understood intuitively, right? So people can't be close to each other, people can't travel, so remote access could be helpful, right? Um, but there's a little more to the story and we should expand on it a little bit. Um, first off, taking the key COVID-19 operational challenges on the screen, it's clear remote access has the potential to help with these issues. Um, so for example, if your OEM could remotely access all the machines they need to, with the software that they need, that would relieve the fact that travel is difficult for them right now. Or if remote access could be quickly set up when and wherever it's needed for a project, you could resume those commissioning efforts which are paused right now. Or if fewer vendors were coming to the facility to troubleshoot, period, that would be a less, uh, there would be less escorting of visitors and better social distancing. 
Um, but aside from the COVID-19 related risks being reduced, there are other benefits as well. So it could reduce troubleshooting time in general and thus increase production capacity. It could expedite project schedules in general, free up resources to perform other higher value work for the company. Um, the last one is my favorite. What if OT staff were able to manage uh, the remote access uh, themselves with IT being okay with it, that could smooth out the workflow quite a bit. Now, I would say most people recognize the stuff that's on the screen right now. The benefits of remote access are generally acknowledged. However, when we go down this path of thinking, uh, you very quickly reach the yes, but part of the thought process. Uh, yes, but there are security concerns. Um, yes, but IT would need to approve that. Yes, but vendors have special licensed software, which they need to access the machine. So a remote access solution isn't gonna help. Um, yes, but IT already has a process and putting in a new one would be arduous. And here I think is, uh, sort of where people get stuck. Uh, what's on the screen sort of summarizes where the pursuit of improving remote access starts to hit some bumps, which results in one of two things. You either scrap the idea of a new remote access solution directly to your ICS and you just keep with the status quo, or OT staff take some shortcuts to do what they need to get done and they put something like a cellular VPN router directly to their controls environment and thus uh, add a new security risk. So this is where we sort of want to move past. And from here on, we're going to be talking about ways to do that via explaining different types of solutions that are out there and how to justify them internally. So let's look at ICS remote access solutions. Um, one of the main reasons I'm giving this webinar is because I can see that customer needs have suddenly increased. And at the same time, remote access solution marketing has suddenly increased, which is actually making it more difficult for users to discern the good from the bad and navigate the noise. So let's talk about what types of solutions are out there and what does a good one look like in general and what does a bad one look like in general. Um, now I'd categorize ICS remote access solutions into three broad categories. And and this is sort of my way of how I see it for industrial environments and categorize it in my mind. Now, the first is, I guess, what I'll call endpoint to endpoint connectivity technologies. And you can implement these technologies or combinations of these technologies yourself to achieve whatever your goals are. And I, I sort of further subcategorize these into network-based approaches, something like a VPN, a application-based approach, something like TeamViewer, and something like a, a hardware appliance approach, like an E1. Now, in the ICS world, it is generally established that things like this directly to ICS are a bad practice. And while that statement is true, it is also a bit of a mischaracterization at the same time. It's not that these technologies are inherently bad. It's that implementing these must be done in a designed and deliberate way, and it must be maintained. And if that's not done, for example, if you implement a VPN and you're not patching and maintaining it and monitoring it, the security goes out the window really quickly, and that's what makes it a bad practice. Um, IT uses these types of technologies all the time. Um, many solutions uh, or baked in solutions use these technologies under the hood, but it is not something that a person on the plant floor should be installing. Now, the second type I see in general are rendezvous server type solutions. Um, compared to the previous category, which I would call technologies, this category is more architected solutions which you can purchase. And they generally work by having everybody connect to one server at the facility, and then that server or system passes the user through to where they are allowed to go. So it sort of works like a gatekeeper based on who's coming through the gate, they're allowed to progress to certain endpoints. Um, and sometimes the user isn't being given direct access to the endpoint actually, they're sort of just given a window view into it rather than the direct connection to it. So um, some examples of uh, uh, technologies and platforms that work like this are Siemens Cinema RC, Clarity SRA, or Beyond Trust's Privileged Access. Um, these, in my opinion, are good to deploy. Um, features are different between them. Uh, their exact approach is different. Um, they each have pros and cons. You would want to evaluate which one is the best for you. Um, but if you find one that you really like, you're not making a poor decision by implementing these. Um, you do need to think through uh, things that, as part of the planning process. So how is it gonna be owned and maintained? The process for adding vendors or managing access. Is it an IT function or an OT function? Uh, things like that. But overall, uh, not bad choices at all. Um, the third category is a little bit more amorphous. Um, it can be a hybrid of the two previous 
or some form of integrated platform, or maybe it's something custom. In, in a little bit of a way, it's sort of a catch-all other bucket because anything that falls into this category is usually somewhat unique. Um, Dispel is one of these. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But it is a comprehensive solution that incorporates several related components into one platform. Um, TDI's console works is another example of this. Uh, you can look them up, but their platform integrates quite a number of capabilities into one platform as well. And then custom platforms. So uh, let's say you have your own cloud environment, um, which you networked into your facilities, and you allow remote access through that. Uh, something like that would also be a good example in this column. So in my experience, these are the broad categories of solutions uh, that you have at your disposal for ICS remote connectivity. It's at least how I see them. And perhaps if you look at it this way, you can immediately eliminate some things that you've been considering or further nar narrow down your search based on what type of solution you think is, is your organization's preference. Now, regardless of which specific solution you're interested in, there are certain characteristics that indicate a quality solution from a poor one, no matter what. Um, first is if it's used in sensitive industry sectors like government, utilities, defense, and critical infrastructure, those sectors will vet the solution from perspectives which you may not. Um, for example, critical infrastructure customers are going to look at its NERC SIP compliance very closely. Um, government would look at the possibility of foreign influence on the, on the developer or information theft. So leverage their efforts, and if the solution is being deployed in those areas, that's usually a good uh, indication that the solution is secure. Um, the next indicator is whether security is engineered at its core rather than being a feature added on top. Um, for providers that do this right, what they're really selling to you first is security, and then they're selling access to you second. In fact, if you were to go talk to your IT, uh, what do they prioritize? They would tell you they prioritize security over access. And that's what your uh, remote access solution should be doing as well. Um, doing a technical review of how the solution works on the inside will, will basically tell you this. You want to be seeing uh, the, the latest and greatest security technologies at the deepest levels of its architecture. Um, another positive indicator is, is whether the developer demonstrates uh, regular penetration testing and better yet, sharing the results with you. I mean, you may not normally think of this, but ask your provider if they undergo penetration testing. And if they say yes, ask if you can see the results. Um, they, uh, that will certainly give you a better level of insight into their security. And providers who are proud of their security do share it. Um, you also want a developer who demonstrates security as part of their internal policies, procedures, and processes, not just their products. So things like physical security, regular training, internal audits, designated security roles. Um, these are the types of things that a good organization, a good security organization follows. Um, and anybody selling remote access should be considering themselves a security organization. Um, in fact, there are uh, control system cybersecurity standards out there which give guidance on how product developers and your service providers should be internally maintaining their own programs, which you can educate yourself on in order to um, intelligently quiz your providers. Um, Finally, um, things like ISO certifications or other cybersecurity independent certifications are the last uh, positive indicator. Whoops, there you go. Positive indicator I would mention. So most buyers consider this. Uh, however, make sure you understand these certifications and what they mean. If, if a provider isn't certified, that can be okay. Many aren't for various reasons, but at the very least, they should be able to demonstrate how they align to a standard. Okay, we can also look at this from the opposite perspective. So what are indicators of a bad solution? Now, the first and most obvious one is if uh, they are missing positive indicators. Um, the second, referencing encryption as proof of security is a, uh, is a bad sign, at least for me. So if I get on the phone with a provider and I ask, how do you maintain your security? And one of their go-to uh, proofs is, hey, I encrypt our communication and we use this encryption technology. It actually indicates to me that they might not have many other uh, more uh, uh, um, modern secure technologies implemented. Um, it's a small yellow flag that makes me ask more questions personally. Um, third, being unfamiliar with the ICS environment and the unique challenges is something I investigate. Um, remote access solutions for ICS are different, so you want a solution that's familiar with ICS specifically. Um, elaborating on that point a bit, one of the common challenges with ICS is difficult or infrequent patching. So look into how often patches are being released for the platform and, ask, un, and understand if patching will be easy or difficult to do. And finally, um, elaborating on ICS challenges, 
is the coordination between IT and OT. It's a common pain point that OT issues are spontaneous, but IT's remote access procedures take time and must be set up in advance. So if you want a solution uh, which can be managed by OT with IT oversight, look into that uh, from the start. Now, at this point, we've gone through the types of remote access solutions that are out there and how to identify good versus bad. Um, going forward, we're going to talk about how to calculate the return on investment for remote access. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Ian. Thank you. Give me one moment. All right. So the mission of any form of remote access system is to help support the same objectives that you have every day, regardless of what you're doing at your firm. And that is to maximize the uptime, availability, and safety on your site facilities. Now, that is why you retain a company such as Grand Tech to always be on the alert if something is falling apart, and also why you enable remote access so you can react immediately rather than waiting for people to fly out to a site. This is a typical network diagram. You have your plant on the right-hand side, they have a security stack, and they have a set of assets. Well, you need to access one of those assets. The basic story of what the ideal world scenario would be is that the person who needs to do work on that asset simply plugs a box into that asset, plugs themselves into another box, and then has a cellular connection between those two devices. That enables, one, a physical relationship between that asset and the action being performed on it, namely the operator is able to walk to that device and say, right, I need access to this one device or enable, I need to enable access to that one device. I'm going to plug this thing in. And it also gives a person a rapid way of working on that asset. That's the ideal. But then comes in cybersecurity. And the purpose here is not to take you through every permutation of what could go wrong, but rather give you an understanding as to why cybersecurity gets so concerned whenever anyone is doing remote access. The first problem, which hit a number of managed service providers last year, is that attackers would simply go after the managed service provider, burn through their remote access system, and hit the assets that they were servicing, and then spread the infection laterally behind the security stack. The other problem is when these things are plugged in without telling cybersecurity, usually by an operator who has decided in a moment of nearsightedness that they just need something to get fixed, well, the cybersecurity person has no idea what their network looks like anymore. So that's alarming. The second solution that we often see is someone obeys some of the rules. So they place a box on site that provides a point-to-point -point VPN that passes through the security stack to reach out to the person on the other side. For reasons of how firewalls work, if the data is being encrypted next to the asset to be transmitted out to the person on the other end, you cannot really run many of your security analyses on that data. So that renders your security stack somewhat useless. The second concern, however, is that, again, someone can just burn straight through to the asset and then laterally hit across. The solution that many providers who are trying to enter this space from that posture of being a point-to-point -point VPN is to offer an intermediary device in the form of a firewall, which will decrypt the data coming out of the asset or coming from the person trying to remotely access the asset and then analyze it before passing it on. That would be brilliant, except these same providers are competing very tightly on cost, so they tend to do what is known as multi-tenanting their firewall, which means all of their customers are passing through their firewall rather than just one, which means that the best viruses that one person has that can break through that firewall are now your problem too. The solution that the world came to was using an intermediary component. You've known these your entire life. They're known as virtual desktops. There are only two things I'd like to say about these virtual desktops. First is they can be considered part of the security stack because what they're doing is absorbing a large number of the viruses that otherwise would be hitting the facility. And then the second is that they're disposable. So after each use of a virtual desktop, you can burn it down and build a new one. The result being that any viruses that were on there are gone. The second is that you can have diversity of the underlying system that generates this virtual desktop. 
Now, one point I'd like to make here is you cannot have just one hypervisor. If you do, you're concentrating your risk. What is a hypervisor? That is the system that generates the environment on which a virtual desktop lives. To belabor this point for a moment, these are common vulnerabilities and exploits that are located uh, in the space of virtualization that have happened in the past few months. My one thing here, takeaway here is if you find people in cybersecurity talking about how they need to move to the cloud, this is why it gives them diversity. So the important lessons to take away from this in terms of what does a person in cybersecurity care about? Well, one, they care about a remote access system being visible to them. Two, they want it to be segmented from the rest of the environment. So that way, if something bad happens to one asset, it doesn't spread to the others. They need an intermediary component and they want it to be disposable and diverse. So what does work? Even though only 5% of people seem to be having cybersecurity at top of mind at a firm-wide level, you can go to almost every firm and find someone whose only job is to keep the world safe. And they build, typically, their own remote access solutions. So we're going to use the tale of Tom. His real name is not Tom, but he works in irrigation. And he has large plants. Tom had built a system, so on the right we have our asset cluster, and on the left we have an operator or third party that needs access to that asset cluster. Well, what Tom did was he had the operator VPN to the corporate network and then pass through the pre-existing security stack that he had located there. After they VPN to the corporate network, they then went to something called a jump host, which once they figured out how to get through that, they went to another jump host, which was on the asset cluster, and then they did an RDP connection to a virtual machine that had been stood up on a private cloud that linked them to the asset cluster. Now, this worked, but connecting securely to industrial control systems through this system was taking 12 to 15 minutes. And from the, from the perspective of operations, this was both madness and it was wrong because they were arguing their time should matter more than that. So the villain in all of this, from an engineering perspective, which Tom came to find, was friction. These components that we were looking at were each requiring a human interaction, a deliberative one. So you're VPNing to the corporate network. Well, that takes a few minutes. Your jump post process, if you remember how to get through a jump post, that takes a few minutes, and so on. What Dispel does is we do secure remote access to industrial controls in about 20 seconds. The way this works is as follows. So let's say we have on the left, our product control team, and on the right, we have a set of different facilities. We're gonna distinguish these as separate networks. Each of these has its own security stack and its own internet access point. We're gonna narrow this down to one facility for visual clarity. The first thing that gets placed at the network perimeter is something called a Wicket external systems integrator. Now, I will note, however, that this and the product control team for the purposes of this conversation are Grantech related devices. So what Dispel has done is place, place its external systems integrator onto the box that Grantech ships you as part of engineer in a box. What that software allows is for the system to proactively reach out and find what we call an enclave. This is a moving target defense software defined wide area network. If you happen to be interested in cyber resiliency, I would refer you to the new NIST standards that call for moving target defense networking. But in any case, this is, and to break the rule about talking about encryption, a cascade ciphered network, which is using AES-256 with independent 4096 bit keys for the initial key exchange. In any case, this network ties into the cloud-based assets that different vendors afford to perform maintenance on, asset, on OT devices. So let's say this is the Rockwell support system that would be based on a cloud. How do you link that in safely? We use the equivalent of the software that's at the network perimeter, but instead on a virtual machine in the cloud where the Rockwell system is located. If you want to do patching, what we do is we stage these onto servers that are tied directly to the enclave. This allows Grantech, for example, or the cybersecurity team to come in and analyze those patches to make sure that they work before pushing them down to the assets. 
Then there's a virtual desktop. Each one of these virtual desktops is launched specifically for one particular person with the tools that they need to do the particular job that they've been assigned to do. When the person is done with their task, this virtual desktop is destroyed and replaced with a, ref a fresh one. People are able to access this system through a web-based console. That web-based console uses whatever authentication methods the customer desires. And then comes the part that cybersecurity really cares about, which is knowing what happened and when it happened. So this is tying in recording systems, logging systems, the ability to watch over the proverbial shoulder of the person who's accessing an asset to see if they're making a mistake. And all of that ties back to both security teams and OT teams if they're providing support. Finally, and this we do not expect to happen very frequently, we do have a solution for if you have a tablet-based system, for example, where you trust these devices and they don't otherwise have internet access. Well, if you trust the device and it's part of your network, there should be a way to access the system even faster. And we do that using an application. So this will get you to your OT system in about three seconds instead. Now comes the point of, well, that's all very nice. You've shown me all of these pictures. That's how the network works. How do I assess that in comparison to any other remote access system? What I've noticed is that operational technology environments are very good at, the, at analyzing each and every single device that comes in and out of their system mathematically as long as it's a physical device. But when it comes to IT, that system tends to get a pass. Let's look back at this mission one more time. Maximize uptime, availability, and crew safety subject to the constraints of individual human time, process blocks, so this would be, I can't work on one thing for less than 30 minutes, I need to do the entire process, and money. If you are an industrial engineer, this is a linear program. The way to think about this for remote access is we're dealing with not a component, not a system, but a system within a system, and that system is your entire firm. So what I recommend is look at your environment just for a moment and say, okay, I have a set of disparate systems. They all work together. There are systems engineers who've modeled most of this. Well, why can't I search for optimality also when I'm shopping for a remote access solution? And the answer is you can. The way you do that is you start with a lot of variable collection. This process takes about two weeks to do. The next is you find a systems engineer. They could also be called an industrial engineer. And the third is you ask them to do a linear program. They will probably fall out of their chair, but it won't take them very long to do. The inputs I recommend you collecting are individual time. So how long per day can a person work on a particular set of tasks? How much does it cost per unit's individual time? The maximum time that person has per day to do anything. The time it takes them to perform a task once connected the time to get to that task by different methods. And in this case, I'm referring to flying, driving, remoting in, and the costs of those different methods. And finally, the administrative implications. Fortunately, you aren't going to need to worry about this last one too much. Whether you like it or not, you have already been modeled into most cor corporate systems. So specific to remote access, I like to do variable collection in a manner which anyone can understand from afar, which means I break it up into setup, management, and use. What you're gonna notice here is that times to install things, times to train people, these vary significantly between different remote access systems. If you're looking at this and trying to poke a hole in the model, the first thing you're going to notice is that this very quickly can turn into a nonlinear project. It is not, you need to untangle it anyways to collect the variables, and I recommend you do. If you have any questions about this, just call us. The second step is find a systems engineer. That's either an industrial engineer by training, a systems engineer by title, or that guy who's known as the statistics wonk on floor B. You need to show them what you've already built. It could look something like this. It could look something like an Excel file. But in any case, you then ask them to build and run a proper model. What you will get is a result that tells you that time matters a great deal in this whole process. So you're going to end up balancing cybersecurity with a very fast solution. On that note, I'm now going to hand the baton back to Jacob. 
All right, let me grab the screen back. <clears throat> okay, and it should be up now. So um, thanks, Ian, it for is. going through. Dispel and Grantech worked on together, which uh, Ian mentioned we call Engineer in a Box. It's a very different type of solution you can put into your toolbox. And I do want to clarify, uh, we're not really presenting this as the end-all be-all solution that you should be buying right now, but it is something that's a little bit different that I think you should be aware of. And again, keep in your toolbox. So first, let's define the target audience and who it's meant to help. So this solution is specifically meant to help those that are working on the plant floor. So are there maintenance to deal with surprise issues? Uh, service providers that need access for an engineering project or your commissioning staff, or OEMs that need access to machines to support them and provide warranty. Um, second, let's look at uh, how this usually works today. So as Ian mentioned, typically remote support uh, gets in through the uh, gets into the industrial network through the business network. Um, and they can come through the business network, uh, connect to a server running some programming software on it. And then that programming software will then have access to the device uh, that needs to be reached. And that's basically what the blue line is showing on the graphic. And there's nothing inherently wrong with this. Uh, Grantech uses setups like this, uh, and we install them all the time. Um, of course, it's not the perfect solution for all situations, and uh, most people know this. So what are the situations where it's not as helpful as it could be? So for example, um, the process you need to go through with IT can be a little bit cumbersome. Um, it's really understandable. IT has to manage a lot under their purview um, and keep it secure. And to do so, they need processes uh, to do that. But it can be slower than OT would need in certain situations when something urgent arises or a change needs to be made. Um, the other challenge with this setup, um, uh, where it's not the perfect fit, is that you need uh, the programming software running on the servers and licensed in advance. Um, network configurations also need to be set up in advance. Server usernames and passwords need to be linked up. And doing all of that usually takes some sort of an internal project and budget. Um, to do, so it's not a simple endeavor. Uh, basically, there's nothing wrong with this, it works. You're probably still gonna be using this in some places, um, but the, the big thing that it's lacking is flexibility. So <clears throat> what we came up with is a way um, to help with those type of staff members in those type of uh, uh, flexible situations. So uh, next I'll talk about what Engineer in a Box actually is, and it's simple enough. It's a hardware appliance that those on the plant floor can use to connect remote support staff to the network or devices directly. It looks like the image on the screen, it needs power and an internet connection to run, and that's essentially it. Um, it can get that internet connection either through the plant's Wi-Fi or an LTE connection. Um, if neither of those work, it can also get internet through the plant's LAN, but Wi-Fi and LTE is honestly simpler. Um, and there is no configuration that is done by on-site staff. Essentially, uh, if you were to purchase one, theoretically, Grantech pre-configures it and ships it to the facility so uh, its backend connections work automatically as soon as it's powered up. Um, Grantech can even remotely change the box's IP address through that automatically established remote connection. So next, let me describe how it would actually work and what that would look like. Um, essentially, a maintenance or a project team member can uh, basically carry the engineer in a box around with them and connect it directly into whatever they're having an issue with, sort of like Ian's ideal model uh, intro slides. Um, they can connect it directly into the device or into a nearby switch. And then from their perspective, that's all that they need to do. And now the remote support person uh, can reach what they need to. Um, they can now sort of securely, quote unquote, bypass IT's uh, business systems. In the back end, the appliance is using the LTE or Wi-Fi connection to connect to the Dispel secure environment that Ian went over um, using the secure technology um, mentioned, the moving target defense. Um, so for some users, this would be enough. Um, they no longer need to go through the IT process to get a user added and establish a new connection to a device, which is a huge benefit. However, for other customers, uh, you can get uh, some additional and uh, value out of it. Um, a great unique part of this solution is that you can actually migrate those programming applications into uh, Dispel's cloud environment. And this brings uh, a ton of additional benefits. So for example, you no longer need to maintain those servers on site, updating and patching them is easier. 
If you need to establish a new vendor or a connection to a new device, this can be done quickly by the OT staff themselves without, uh, with IT oversight, as, uh, of course, but without needing as much direct IT involvement. Um, the best part is that you don't need a coordinated project to deploy new software to the cloud or set up new connections. Um, so remember how I mentioned earlier that typical setups work, but they're lacking flexibility. This sort of gives that flexibility while maintaining security and even adding some additional benefits. Um, and if you go through the ROI calculation that Ian laid out, um, it also saves a ton of money over time. Now, the last thing I'll touch on is scalability. Um, rearranging the slide a bit, I'll show you what it would look like to scale out the solution. And essentially, it looks exactly the same at the second facility. Um, the second facility would have another engineer in a box, which would connect to the same secure environment with the same programming servers available. Um, and this is also uh, a big benefit. So organizations have been looking for a way to leverage the cloud and reduce computing resources. And this platform sort of gives you a way to do so easily, plus it gives you the remote access. Um, so it would mean you don't need individual facilities to maintain and license the same software over and over. Um, a server image can be set up once and then reused for to service as many facilities as you need it to be accessed from. Um, because Engineer in a Box is portable, you can also ship them to remote locations for commissioning when it's needed. So it could be shipped to a remote location for commissioning. Those same programming servers are able to reach it. Somebody could be remotely commissioning and then it can be shipped back when you no longer need it. Um, so the ROI calculation works in your favor for one deployment, but it also compounds when you factor in sharing server resources between facilities and remote locations, travel cost savings, downtime reduction, relief from IT timelines and labor, and so on. It all becomes larger as you scale up. Um, for now, that's all the overview I'll give of Engineer in a Box. I didn't want to go into extreme detail as part of this webinar, but I did want to introduce it to you. Um, if you're interested or just curious about understanding this better, please do put a message in the chat box or reach out to us. Uh, Ian or I can get on the phone with you to discuss in greater detail whatever's helpful for you. Um, and that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Um, we'll be spending the rest of the time we have answering questions that have been posted. Um, if you haven't posted any but have a question, feel free to post them now. Um, also, in case I don't get to your question, you can email us at info at grantech.com and I promise we'll get back to you. So um, I, I see this is the first question I'll read off. Uh, what LTE provider? I have customers where Verizon is available, but AT&T is usable. So um, it is a, the engineer in a box is a sort of, I guess I'll phrase it as a managed solution. So um, you don't need to take care of the, uh, um, the, the LTE service that comes as part of the solution. Um, and we are able to get that signed up on whatever um, provider is gonna be uh, your preference. Um, the next one, uh, what kind of port do you use for connect connecting engineer in a box to devices? Okay, so that's another good question. Essentially, uh, it, it natively is able to connect to any ethernet-based device uh, or the ethernet network um, directly, in which, at which point it can connect to any device which it can reach on the network. Um, you can also support serial device troubleshooting through it. Uh, in that case, a, an additional sort of peripheral support box is shipped to you with a serial um, uh, troubleshooting software that you need, and that gets loaded on there. And then you can reach that box through the engineer in a box. Okay. Um, does it support an external antenna? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, actually, the, the specific hardware that it is deployed on is pretty flexible. There's some minimum software requirements, and usually the, uh, the hardware uh, just comes down to you know, something that, that is reasonable and appropriate. Um, for any of these hardware type questions, um, it's if there is a custom requirement, if you need some sort of a special antenna or you know your site and you need know the hardware needs to support something, that can be um, modified depending on what you need. In general, we're using a very low power um, industrial PC running a like a headless uh, version of Linux. Um, what, to, what if your support requires connection to multiple plant devices, HMI, PLC, and drive? What if your support requires connection to multiple plant devices? Yeah, so you can, um, I guess there's two different ways that you can deploy engineer in a box. Um, the, the 
the, I guess, uh, targeted use case that we developed this for is the plant operator who needs to unplug it, carry it around with them, plug it into a different device. Unplug it, carry it around, plug it into a different device. So you could troubleshoot one at a time in that case. Um, you can also plug uh, the engineer in a box into like your industrial DMZ, at which point through that single box, you can now basically connect to anything on your network that you configure your industrial DMZ to be able to reach. So in that scenario, that single engineer in a box could be used to reach and troubleshoot all of your HMIs, your PLCs and drives, anything that's ethernet connected. Um, so exactly how you deploy it, um, there's a lot of flexibility. If you do go that route where you sort of want engineer in a box to give access to everything in your facility, you're probably looking less for engineer in a box and more for like a, a more full deployment of the Dispel platform in your facility. So um, you might want to actually upgrade in, in that context, but either could work. And then to, to maybe my last comment on that question is your HMIs, depending on which, what HMIs you have, are going to require their you know, flavor of software. Your PLCs are going to require their flavor of software. All of that software can be migrated into the cloud environment to support all of those HMIs and all of those PLCs at all of your facilities with that one server instance. Um, if you, I sort of mentioned this in a, in a previous slide, if you don't prefer to migrate your programming servers into the cloud, that's okay too. You can still use the engineer in a box for remote users to access those programming servers that you remain hosted on site. Um, I see a question. Um, uh, how do you suggest we try this? Um, that is a great question. Um, I would, I would say maybe even more than 50% of the, um, customers who we're already uh, working with and provided engineer in a box to, more than half of them want to try it sort of before they buy it. So for the hardware, there is a, a rental model and you can sort of just get one engineer in a box and rent it for a period of time. Um, the amount of access that you get through the engineer in a box is also a variable. So you can get something like 24 seven access to the box or something that's more limited to control your cost. So you can basically rent one box with some very small access parameters just so you can test it out and tinker with it. And then if you decide that you like it and you think it works well, then you can you know, call us back and say, hey, I want, I want additional boxes and I want the support or the access to work you know, 24 seven or 24 hours, whatever it is that, that you want. So you can sort of start small and then scale up. So that's how I'd suggest you try this if you're curious. Um, let's see. Uh, what programming software does Engineer in a Box support and who provides the remote support? So um, for the most part, I'm going to say any programming software that you need uh, migrated into the cloud can be migrated into the cloud for you. Um, I think Dispel provides both Linux and Windows uh, OS uh, virtual desktop, so that OS is flexible depending on what you need. I don't think we've run into a scenario yet where the software wasn't able to be migrated into the cloud. Um, licensing can be a little bit of a uh, uh, a little bit of a hurdle that you need to go through. Some um, industrial software, their licensing model sort of gets a little bit funky when you're you're um, migrating into the cloud in the way that it's hosted. Um, but we basically work through that, and uh, we haven't run into a scenario where it wasn't able to be migrated. Um, does it work on uh, Modbus? Uh, yes, it does work with Modbus. Um, actually, Ian, you might be able to elaborate on that more than, than I can. The, I'm going to assume that that question expands to not just Modbus, to, but to other protocols which are being communicated by devices that were probably built well before the internet was even a concept that people in the regular world would think about every day. The short answer is that yes, they tie into them. The way that is done is adjacent to engineer in a box. You put down a device which acts as a translator. These are third party devices that you can get off the shelf. Um, there's actually a lot of questions. I, I hope I don't miss any. Um, <clears throat> and just in case I do miss one, again, um, feel free to reach out afterwards, or uh, uh, I can also try to get a log of this and make sure that we reach back out to you. Um, so next question, uh, is there a data cap for the LTE communication speed and total gigabyte? The answer is uh, no, there is not a data cap. 
essentially this is sold as a subscription model and uh, both uh, grant text management services, um, the data, those, those are all included as part of the uh, solution. Um, who manages and maintains the engineer in a box hardware? Um, so similar type of answer. I, I did mention earlier that you can either rent the appliance, um, in which case you're basically renting the appliance software and also renting the appliance hardware itself. In that case, Grant Tech manages it for you, things like upgrades, that sort of thing. Um, you can also buy it outright. Um, it's obviously a little bit, it's the typical pricing model. It's a little bit cheaper in the long run if you own it outright or you can subscribe and have it managed uh, do a subscription and have it managed for you. So depending on whether you buy it outright um, or you uh, uh, sort of rent the, the appliance, then uh, that changes who, who manages and maintains it. But um, uh, Let's see, how long does it take to deploy this thing? Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, Ian, maybe you wanna comment on it too, but for the engineer in a, plot, in a box form factor, it's we ship it to you. Uh, pre-configured, like I mentioned, and it just takes a, uh, you, you know, you power it up and plug it in via an Ethernet port, and that is it. Um, so however long it takes you to do that, there is obviously like a procurement timeline to get the hardware, configure it, and ship it out to you. But in terms of, you know, deploying it uh, to yourself, it's seconds, minutes. If you are going for the cheapest conceivable model, then there is the chance that you might need to have a person run between devices to plug engineer in a box into another piece of equipment versus having it sit at a higher level within your network so it can instantly reach down. But when we're just deploying to spell systems independently, the longest deployment time we've had was at Las Vegas Water, in which case it took us a total of uh, roughly four hours to do the deployment because we were physically moving between locations. Um, any thoughts on using engineer in a box with AR VR headsets to provide remote support? Uh, would that be separate? Would that be a separate or maybe complementary solution? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I would kind of want to say that I'd like to understand the AR VR headsets, uh, how what software supports them, where does that software need to live? Essentially, engineer in a box is connecting users to software in the cloud to end devices. So if the AR VR headset can fit into that sort of model, then yes, it would be supported. But I would probably need to understand a little bit more about the, the AR VR headset. Um, Ian, I don't know if you've had any personal experiences with uh, using engineer in a box or dispel with AR VR. If so, uh, feel free to chime in. The key challenge is the signal strength from the location. Okay. But it, and that ties into another question I'm seeing on I indicators to conform, confirm that LTE signal quality and connection have been established. The, the main challenge when you're dealing with a remote site, if you're using a, a wireless signal is where's the closest antenna and how good of a Yagi do you have pointed at it? Uh, but if you're, if you have good signal strength, it's just a video signal and you can compress that effectively and get it across. Awesome. Okay, and then uh, we are just about at time. We have three minutes. I'm gonna take the last question. Um, and I see, are there indicators to confirm LTE signal quality and uh, connection establishment? Is there an indication of when engineer, uh, when a remote engineer is connected? So I'm gonna answer the second part. Um, is there an indication when a remote engineer is connected? And then I'm actually, I would need to check into if there can be a physical or like a software indicator of the LTE signal quality. Um, but for that second question, um, uh, Dispel's platform includes a pretty comprehensive logging solution. You can even have those remote connections um, recorded if you want to. Um, so those can be built into the subscription model depending on what you require. So you can certainly get some pretty comprehensive tracking of when uh, remote engineers connected and what they were doing. Okay. And uh, yeah, that, that brings us pretty much to time. Um, so thank you very much for coming. I, uh, I really hope you enjoyed and found the information useful. 
Uh, if you want to reach out later, please do send an email to info at grantech.com. Essentially, the email will be routed directly to me, and I promise we'll follow up with you. If you want to have a, a side uh, discussion with Ian or I, uh, we can for sure set that up. We're always available, and we'd love to. So yeah, thank you guys very much, and have a good rest of your afternoon.